How many challenges does it take to screw in a light bulb? Two. One to screw it in and one to shoot the witness. But in all seriousness, sorry, for a half Italian friend here, they actually used to be a pretty useful people. For 500 or so years ago, they discovered the United States, at least granted they used someone else's cash to do it, but they discovered the United States. And Christopher Columbus has fallen into some ill repute lately because communists take the side of cannibals over brave Christian explorers. It's kind of a common thing in our society. We are here today, Daniel Turner and I, to show you how to make a phenomenal Christopher Columbus Day dinner for all your friends, all your neighbors, all your enemies, whoever you want to invite. And to celebrate this in a way that's, you know, not just eating maize and ground up meal and everything else. What, what did the Indians eat before the Italians showed them tomatoes? Uh, uh, buffalo. <laughs> buffalo. I think we actually discovered uh, tomatoes in the New World, too. I'm Chris Bedford at The Federalist, here for another edition of How to Cook in My Kitchen. And if there's one person out there who's a better chef than me, I haven't met him, but Daniel Turner here <laughs> is very good at cutting onions and smashing garlic and comic relief. And he's half Italian. And a, and a, and a much better, much better <laughs> cook. But I'm glad we're doing this. We did this once before. Remember when they, when they were banning meat from certain cookbooks? We did a meat episode. It's fun to be back to talk about this because, yeah, we live in a time now that like 25-year-olds can't have a, a Ben Shapiro presentation without breaking down in tears and being triggered. Yeah, and you and, turn on the Food Network and you hear about how the food of Cote d'Ivoire is the fundamental building block of Western Civ, and yeah. it's like ridiculous. And 500 years ago, we had guys who were so brave that they were like, hey, look, don't go past this line in the ocean because there's a cliff and you'll go off the edge straight into hell and die. And Columbus was like, let's say, yeah. right? I mean, bravery beyond bravery. And I think we stand on his shoulders of, 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 of bravery and exploration, and, and now we mock him. We tear down his statues. Heck, we tear down his statues everywhere. Not in New York, though. The Italian-Americans are fighting hard for Columbus Circle, and I think they have like a permanent guard, but in most other places. It's too high to pull that thing down. It's a big statue. It's like Saddam Hussein yeah. height. It's a great, <laughs> great statue. We, um, I would let them tear down more statues if they still made pretty ones, but they don't. They don't, because no. there's no more Italian artisans. All right, let's get started. What are we cooking today, Turner? You know, I think we're going to do a classic Italian-American uh, um, Sunday red sauce with meat. You know, we didn't grow call it gravy growing up. I know a lot of people did. Um, my mom is Italian, so I learned to cook from my mom. And this was like the standard Sunday. You started it early. It cooked for a couple of hours. Um, it always had, uh, I'm using San Marzano, which are the good tomatoes to use. Um, and I like, you know, I... Fresh tomatoes are always great. I like canned tomatoes because you always know what you're getting and they're imported from Italy and they're fantastic. Uh, a little bit of onion, a little bit of garlic, a lot of meat, and we'll let this thing simmer for a couple hours. So the first step is, step one, cut the onions. Yes. Now, cut and peel your onions. I have that pot going, it's warm, right? Because I, I, we want it to be a little bit, uh, we want it to be hot so the flame is on low. Oil. Yeah, and, and a good healthy dose of oil. But right? you know, you want a healthy dose because you're going to put in a lot of onions, you're going to put in garlic. You do not want it to burn. But remember, all of this oil ends up in the sauce. You don't want an oily sauce. You don't want people to ever think that. So, you know, it's be judicious. judicious. What, do the, uh, what do the recipes say? A bunch, but not too much? Yeah, exactly. That's the exact measurement. You know? I, I think you definitely want to have like a, like a film on the bottom, but not like swimming. And remember, you can always add. If, you, if your onions and your vegetables suck up too much of the oil, add some more. That's fine. Now, what we're going to do, which is, again, the way my mom did it. Let's open this garlic clove a little bit. And this is the way, eh, how many? We got four cans of tomatoes. I'm going to use... Here's a bulb. You think the whole head? I was going to do like five cloves of garlic. It's the food of kings. Destroyer of vampires. Peel these out. Here's my mom's little secret, which we did as growing up, and this is the way I make my sauce, but not everyone does. Want to help me peel some bulbs, or are you just going to stand there useless? Is that what you want me to do? Yeah, peel the paper off. An Englishman, oh, a half Italian, and an Irish guy walk into our kitchen. So what we did, what mama did, she did not like chunky vegetables in her sauce. Mama put the garlic, the onion, oh, that's smart. in the blender with a splash of water, and she pureed it. So, splash of water. The only chunks Mama wanted was meat and maybe a little bits of tomato. Not everyone does this. A lot of people like to saute. I don't mind the onion myself. 
Um, no, but I'm, I'm going for nostalgia here, right? Yeah. I mean, that's all Italy's got. How the hell do you use this blend? Oh, you gotta be smarter than the plug. You could also do this with Parmesan, with, uh, with Pecorino Romano. If you're doing something that's really cheese heavy, like a cacio e pepe or a carbonara, you want to use a blender. And now we have all the flavor of onion and garlic and no chunks of onion and garlic. And we'll let that cook a couple seconds. Now, we, you're going to want to wear an apron with this because it's olive oil. And you drop some water in there. It's going to pop. It's going to get all over your nice shirt. How are you going to meet the girls that way, huh? Covered in grease. We want this to brown a little bit. Speaking of apron, you got to put yours on. Again, another little thing that I learned from mom, which I like whole tomatoes because then you can squeeze them to the texture you want. When you get um, diced tomatoes, petite dice, etc., they have to put something in the can to keep it that shape because it naturally wants to break down. And all those things that are added to the can are just not tomatoes. So get your whole tomatoes because it's just tomato. And if you want it smaller, yeah. grown petite in the, dice, grown then, then cut, chop it up yourself. Grown in the finest mafia graveyards. Yeah. <laughs> Gets a little bit of color. You want to start, we start squeezing? I've never done um, this before. Do you want to do it? Yeah. yeah. Wash your hands and just get in there and go to town. Wow. This is, uh, woohoo! This is frisky. This reminds me of uh, hunting seals. Crashing heads. Okay, so another little thing learned from Mama. I'm not going to use this whole can, I'll probably just use about half. Tomato paste needs to cook. Tomato paste needs, needs to, uh, to brown a little bit it needs a little bit of, of, uh, of heat. So you see these recipes where, again, normally by Irish people, no offense to them, where they just like dump in a can of tomato paste in the liquid, it's always gonna taste a little bit bitter and it's always gonna have that like, like acidic flavor. Tomato paste wants a little bit of time on pure heat to, to, to uh, develop its sugars, heat its sugars and get rid of some of the bitterness. Never just dump tomato paste in something. It's gonna taste like fake. And, I'm learning so many Italian secrets right now. I tell you what, I was at, I walked into my friend Alex Bleach's house. So it's a madhouse. He's half Greek, half Sicilian, married a Puerto Rican. I mean, there's a lot of yelling in this house. <laughs> and somehow I get in charge of cooking food for all the ancient Italians. I'm in charge of dinner now, and I'm you, cooking it. So I, you, I missed you made, a step you made because chowder. we were drinking. No, they wanted chicken parmesan. Yeah, I walk up to the old woman afterwards. Oh, this is a good meal. It's a good meal. I say, are you enjoying the chicken parmesan? She shakes her head and goes, no. Oh, stares she right at me. <laughs> I, was, I, I thought, um, I said, what do, you, what do you want? Why don't you get in the kitchen, old, old lady? But I didn't say that, because you ever seen an Italian woman with a wooden spoon, they'll knock you unconscious. No. The, one of the things I do miss about living in D.C. is small little specialty stores. There are some great butchers out where I live, but I have to drive a little bit. But I love going to Easter Market. I love going to like an actual butcher butcher mm -hmm. who's not just a huge uh, a chain Sorry, store. My, what's the name? Um, What's the name so, of, our, of our pasta guy? I buy pasta from every single week. He's got great pasta. I never look it up, but what's... You know, I, I, exactly. Now you sound like you grew up in a small town where you like the cheese guy, the pasta guy. The, yeah, I got, know, I got just, a cheese guy. Mike. I, I, I got a guy. Mike and Mark. All right. Another little s secret here, which again, the funny thing about Italians, like this meal, everyone who has Italian blood has a version of it. I think Italians, either Italians or Germans are the They most. are ferocious about it because they're irrational, emotional people. Yeah. They get really heated. Either Italians or Germans have the most uh, uh, descendants in America. I'm pretty sure it's Italians. So if, if there are 30 million Italians in, in America, they've all got a version. And there's, right now there's someone watching this who's like, there's no way there that's are more Italians ridiculous. Than, than Irish. There's no way. Everyone and their mother and their grandmother like that. Maybe it, is, it's, maybe it is Irish first. But anyway, my point is right now there's some guy who's like, that's no way, that's ridiculous, that's not how you do it. You know, again, watching mom do it. The meat doesn't brown. If we were making a beef stew or like beef bourguignon or short ribs, you want to brown and sear the meat because you're making a meat sauce. We're not making a meat sauce. We're making a, a tomato sauce that has meat in it. So you want, the, you want to get some heat on it, but we're not going to sear this like you would making a, a, like, a, like a gravy or something. That's a big difference. I know. I, I, you, right you now see, I'm thinking I've been doing everything wrong. No. I feel like I've been doing everything wrong. I've had you know your what? red sauce We're gonna and it's see. fantastic. We're going to see. I've had your red sauce and it's very, very good. But my point is we're not making a, a, a beef stew 
that the beef is the predominant flavor. The predominant flavor is, is tomato. So we want the tomato to come through. So we don't necessarily want to get this, because when you know when you braise it, that whole Maillard reaction, you get the sear, you caramelize all the sugars in the meat, and that, you need, that develops all the beef flavor. We're not looking to develop a ton of beef and, and pork flavor. We want it to be a tomato sauce. That's got some meat in it. So the Italians so, didn't just bring awesomeness to the Americas. They also brought awesomeness back with them. Can you believe that the Italians until Christopher Columbus had not been cooking with tomatoes? Like, uh -huh. ever? It's, this is a South American fruit. So, you know, this is back when globalism was good. When it was run at the tip of a gun. Yeah. <laughs> this, this, well, you know what? This is the funny thing is that if we had a whole conversation about diversity is our strength and we use this, we would probably not be qualified. Because yeah, Asian, it's not Asian pa pasta techniques mixed with South this, American this tomatoes a, and Italian is ingenuity. Great example of diversity is our strength. Um, I, li I like the way this is nice and heated up. We can dump in the tomatoes. Carefully, so we don't want to splatter everywhere. Too late. Don't be afraid of water when you make your sauce because it's gonna reduce for so long. And if it gets too thick, it will start to burn. There are even some recipes I've seen where they say like, add a cup of water. I wouldn't go that crazy. Yeah, but, so but I used to add a half a, I, I would add like probably one can of water total. Yeah. And that's just, that's the only point of that is to give yourself more boiling time. Yeah. You boil off the water, the meat cooks for longer, it gets into the sauce more, but that's it. So if you're not, if you're not trying to spend five hours cooking a sauce, then, uh, then you don't have to add the water. Just add a little bit, add whatever you and need. The people who come to my house to eat, especially when you're over here, know that we're not eating until it's pretty yeah. late. We'll be shiny in the face and a little glassy in the eye before you guys get the first course. Now the, the nice thing is, and this is the magic of television, when we come back periodically, you watch this color change, right? You look at this color now, it's, it's, it's not even, it's, it's like a scarlet red, it's almost got like hints of a bit of pink and purple in it. By the end of this meal, it's gonna be dark, dark red, like that good Italian sauce red. I just wanna get this to come to a bit of a simmer. Right now it's got some hot spots, so you just move it around a little bit because you want the whole thing to come to a, a simmer. We're gonna put the lid on and this guy will go for if I can get five hours out of this, I will be very happy. We'll see. I don't think five hours is unreasonable given the time. Maybe we'll get four and a half, but you know, we got plenty of time. Let's let this puppy go. And, uh, but not a crazy boil, right? We wanna, we wanna get it to the boiling point and then lower it nice and slow, a couple hours. It's gonna be, gonna be fantastic. Oh, and last thing, I didn't add any salt or pepper yet. No salt, no pepper. You can't get rid of that stuff. It's so difficult to do it. You add it to taste at the end. I sometimes yeah. add a little bit around now, just a teaspoon, but you can always add like We'll show you some tricks of how to get rid of any f things that are wrong, too acidic, too sour, too bitter. Yeah, too I've got a whole book on sauces because I'm not of, good at sauces, yeah. but I'm also not good at spelling. So it's just sitting on my shelf. See you in a couple hours, baby. Buona serata. All right, so broccolini. <laughs> Broccolini's Italian for a little garlic. No, a little broccoli. <laughs> so we buy the really fancy garlic here because we're just baking it. And now you just want to use a little bit, maybe a little more. <laughs> what did Emerald say? Bam. Bam. Salt. And pull the sale. Mind your business. Pepper. And pull the pepe. I'll do the translation for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Virgin olive oil. Poise a ginger and the olio the oliva. That was complicated. I said then you're gonna add some olive oil. No. What type of olive oil? Do you use like a really expensive extra virgin, like the little tiny bottle that's five hundred dollars? I use the extra virgin stuff for like making salad dressings yes. and putting on top of cheeses and dipping bread in. But generally, I buy virgin virgin olive oil at Costco for cooking. An extra virgin in Costco for, for like dress like Caesar dressing. But you're not gonna taste not it gonna as much. Heat, you're not gonna heat it. And the reason you want one of the reasons you wanna buy at Costco is because Italians are criminals. So a lot of olive oil is fake, just completely fake. 
Um, can so we, can we pause with, can we back up that line a little of Italians and criminals? Actually, a lot I'm, of tomato sauce, so, straight hand tomatoes you buy are fake. A lot of Italian things are lies and fakes, but companies like the size of Costco yes. have their own task forces. And like Walmart, weirdly enough, where they will send agents and other people to check, like where's this wine coming from? Where is this olive oil coming from? Where is this tomato, cans of tomato coming from? You go to the grocery store, they don't have that. Even if you go to the little mom and pop shop, some of them will actually go over there to Italy, as you know, and, and they'll source their own olive oil, and that's great. But a lot of them are just buying cool looking bottles and it's coming out of the same factory uh, all over the country. And it's probably from like Greece. It's not even Italian. Yeah, it's like Chinese yeah. slave labor in a Greek factory making Italian extra virgin olive oil. When we, so, do the, when we do the cheese board, we can talk about how you can tell real Parmesan. That's an oh, important yeah. thing. But we'll get to cheese in a second. So with I'll the broccoli, I'm just getting this out of the way. Because I'm going to roast the broccolini. Put, uh, put a little tin foil down in every single one of your trays. It's just, you're going to have so many freaking di dishes at the end of this. If people start hearing that you're cooking a big Italian meal, they start to flock. We just added a family of four to our dinner table. Yeah. I told them no seats, but hey, if you can put your infant at a bar, Right here, we're fine. You want to start pulling your cheeses out an hour or so before guests arrive because cheese, there's, there is basically no good cheese, real cheese out there that ought to be served cold, except for maybe like the very soft ones that are gonna melt or like the, the buffalo mozzarella or the um, something like that. Right? When, when I lived Parada. in Italy, the, the real um, uh, buffalo, uh, mozzarella de buffalo, buffalo mozzarella, they would never put in the fridge. And you'd be a little weirded out, like it would be on the counter in water or in, in the brine. And you'd be like, can you do that? And like, you, you don't put oh, it in the fridge. It depends on how quickly you eat it, right? Yeah, now we're getting it sent all the way from Italy, in theory. You just talked about, you know, a lot of- All buffalo mozzarella is actually made in Eastern Market. So, <laughs> but they don't ever put it in the, uh, they don't ever put it in the fridge. So it's not, so it's not buffalo mozzarella, it's just mozzarella. What do we got going here? You want to talk about our cheeses? You want to unwrap them first? Yeah, sure. So why don't you walk us through? Because you can tell, Parmigiano, you can explain to people how you know. So this is very important to see this this um, little rind right there. There's also a way to tell if it's real. There's a stamp that the Italian government puts out, which is um, Domain Origin and Control, uh, uh, DOC, um, DOCP, Dominion or. Uh, Dominazione origine controllata e protegata. It's like the origin of these things are controlled and protected, and you see that initial, that's D O C P stamp. Um, and but on Parmesan, they have to have that, and it, it's with a, which is with a heated, almost like the way you brand cattle. It's a brand they put on the Parmesan, and if you don't see that, it's not. Also, if they spell it P A R M E S I A N, it's not from Italy. There are some nice American. Parmigians, but they're not Parmigiano. Parmigiano has to be spelled the Italian way, and it has to be Parmigiano Reggiano, from the region of Parma, otherwise it's not. One of the weird things about Italy, which I love, um, which I think is a lot, about, a lot of European foods, is it has to be made in a certain area. You can't make Parmesan outside of uh, Emilio Romagna, which is where my grandmother was from. May she rest in peace. Loved my grandmother. Uh, she was from Emilia Romagna, and that's where Parma is. And so if you say like, this is a wonderful Parmesan from Tuscany, <laughs> it's it's not Parmigiana. You can call it whatever you want, but it's not Parmigiana. It has to be from from Parma. So most people just braid Parmesan and they put it on things. Like that's what it's famous for. They make sauces with it. It's like in America, it's generally an add-on. You get it at a shaker at a pizza place. But Parmigiana is one is like the Italian cheese. It's phenomenal. Sometimes you'll see places that offer you some fresh Parmesan. You don't want fresh Parmesan. Parmesan is aged for a very long time. So how the heck do you serve it? Pretty easy. You just crack it. Yeah, don't cut it. Don't slice it. You just break off chunks. Break off chunks. And so a rule of Italian cooking that I learned in this old book called YouTube is... Does the cameraman get to eat? Eh, I guess. The, um, yeah, they're in charge. I joke, I joke. Things go well with things that are grown or come from that exact region, essentially. That's why the Jews are mixing out when they don't mix meat with milk. But you could do figs and balsamic are two of the things that come from the general region of Parmesan. Or uh, what is the region actually called? Emilio Romagna. So take some figs, slice them up. I can almost guarantee you there are no figs from Emilio Romagna. It's too cold. There may be like a, there may be someone has a fig tree, but figs are from the south. Another thing you can do. 
is Drizzle Symbol Sonic on top. It gets a little messy, but you know, you're eating with friends. That's, that's what it is. We have a truffled, I think this is a truffled pecorino. Yes. Truffled pecorino. You can see the veins in there. It's, this is going to be, this is becoming more popular in America. In general, it's kind of difficult to get. Truffle Italy has some of the best truffles in the world. The White Alba truffles from Piemonte. I lived in Piemonte for a couple years. You can um, either slice this thin or you can break it off in chunks. And now would be a great time to live in Italy because it's, I think it's truffle season. We need a pig. We need to go to Italy with a truffle pig. And uh, that would be great. Another great cheese from the same Emilio Romagna. There is a little town called Gorgonzola and the cheese they make in Gorgonzola is Gorgonzola. Um, <laughs> this, uh, that's why, if, like I said, if I ever did a, you know how guys do guys trips and they go to Vegas and they party and go to strip clubs and I would do the most <laughs> different guys trip. We would go to Emilio Romagna and we would just eat. We would have part, we had prosciutto is from Emilio Romagna, balsamic so much vinegar. better than Las Vegas. Oh my gosh, Gorgonzola. <laughs> I hate that filthy uh, place. Tortellini is from par, uh, Emilio Romagna. Um, um, mortadella, uh, culatello, which little, literally means little tiny, can I say asses? Little asses is the, the highest level of, of prosciutto, culatello. Um, it's just the greatest food region. It's the food capital of Italy, probably the food capital of the world. And I would love to do a guy's trip there and we would gain 40 pounds, but be very happy in the yeah, I think it'd be worth it. Oh, and we totally. got some fresh bread from the local baker. It's not a bad looking cheese board. No, and so explain the Latour, because you picked this out. Yeah, I never from saw our this guy, before. We went to Mike Bauer. He's got ba Bauer's fancy cheese. Castelficcio. I don't know where Castelficcio is. I have to find this, but I, he saw this and it's he said this is. House de Ficcio. There you go. Ficcio house. He said, it's, he said it's a soft goat milk's cheese that I am curious to try it. It looks beautiful and it's very soft. Ooh, it's pungent as hell, which smells great. It's a stinky, it's, it, it's gotta be this up on the This is pasteurized north. cow, pasteurized sheep, and pasteurized goat. Oh, it's got Latour, three. three milk, soft, ripened cheese. Smell that, that's, that's, I guarantee you that's close to the French border, because that smells like a French cheese, doesn't it? It sure does. That's, yeah, that's not, that, I mean, it's Italian, but that whole border of, 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 along the French border is a different regional cuisine, which has a lot of French influence. Yeah, it's funny, I was in a, when I was in Austria, I was in Innsbruck, Austria, and I asked my friend of mine, who's from Northern Italy, should I go drive over the border? It's not too far to get some Italian food. He said, man, you don't need to go to drive. You can get that food right there in Innsbruck. It's, oh. You're going to get the same food unless you want to get in the car for three and a half hours and go to a different region of Italy. You're going to get that food in Innsbruck. And sure, to their point, there were prosciuttos. There was everything there. Just right there in Austria. And you think Austria, schnitzel, sausage. No, it's not that part. It's very close to northern Italian food. Yeah. Did you tell people on the camera that that's your own prosciutto, by the way? You should probably take some credit for that. Now it's been hacked into because you, you busted that out a while ago, but Bedford does cure his own prosciutto. Uh, for what was that, two years in, the, in, the, in your cellar? This is grass, oh no, nut and berry fed Berkshire Heritage Park I picked up at Union Market. Uh, we, I cured it for, usually you only have to do it a month. This one took about two months and then dry aged it for two straight years because I didn't want to break up prosciutto in June 2020. No one was feeling up to it. Now, the problem with prosciutto is you're going to have to have skills. I ain't got no skills. It's hard to actually cut it well. Holy cow, this but is But you really get good. a knife that can bend specifically for prosciutto. What's the camera guy think? That's a good, that's a good cut right there. Yeah. You know the meat's now cooking at a different stage because all of the fat in the meat is coming to the surface. I would not skim that out for any amount of money. You mix it right back in, but that's all rising to the top. Really? And yes. I've always scooped it out. I mean, if there's a ton of it, if you got a really, really fatty piece of pork, maybe, but I don't think this is very much. So, I mean, maybe if I wanted to be super, you know, careful, I could scoop out some of this along here, but eh, yeah, I'll get rid of that. Throw it in the fish. Wow, you just bargained yourself down so freaking well, quickly. Well, now I'm worried. You would have to shoot me. You would have to kill me to do that. Now, now, I'm, do that. now I'm worried that everyone's <laughs> going to be like, hey, do, 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 do. what about diabetes and cholesterol? No, so, no, no. This is a man meal. We are celebrating is... Christopher Columbus. Yes. We'll smoke cigarettes. Christopher Columbus is responsible for all the atrocities of the world. Bullshit. One of the bravest people in the history of mankind. 
Didn't you read the book by Howard Zinn? <laughs> yeah, it was stupid. I read it in high school too, but then I grew a brain, a heart, and a dick and realized that Christopher Columbus was more impressive than anyone, nearly, really, a lot of the people we have alive today. Not anyone. <clears throat> and you know that all of, the idea that Christopher Columbus is, an, is a rapist doesn't vibe with any single bit of evidence we have no. from any single person except for one, the guy who wanted his job. He wrote letters back to the king and queen and said, this guy's just raping and killing, he's a mass murderer, as if like the Spanish and the Portuguese are really gonna care that much. But no one believed him because it didn't vibe with his character. The thing about Columbus which frustrates me is right before we started filming there was an article I was reading about Jerry Seinfeld and all 180 of his episodes are gonna be on Netflix and someone asked him if he thinks he should rewrite them or edit them and he said, look, if I was making some what of them of now- What kind of squid asked him that? Exactly, well, yeah, because there's nothing else to talk about. But he said, you, you know, if I was making them now, I may write them differently. But he said, I don't like to look back and change things that are already done. I like to look forward. And if we're able to judge Seinfeld episodes from 20 years ago and say, oh my gosh, that offends me now, how much easier is it to go back 500 years to Columbus? And it just strikes me as the most cowardly and, and privileged, you wanna talk about privilege, to look back at someone from 500 years ago who did things you wouldn't dream of doing. Like I said, you can't listen to an Ann Coulter lecture without, without having a therapy dog and you're gonna judge these guys who jumped on boats that sailed to the end of the world? <laughs> these were with... not big boats. No. <laughs> you look at the uh, Nina, the Pinna, and the Santa Maria, and they're about as long as my house. Exactly. Like, they're, they're not big with boats. All their in, the, in that Atlantic Ocean? With all their provisions, all their water, all their food, and all their saying, all right, let's just see what happens. And, and, and it's just so easy to look and judge other people by your standards today. <laughs> just your privileged, time. comfortable, white, yeah. first world, cushy, Postmates standards. I mean, we th it's pretty insane, those people who go and explore the Arctic Poles. It's insane. People climb on Everest, completely nuts. But no one actually does that with like the just complete total belief that there are monsters there. No. These guys did it, and it's like, yeah, there's sea monsters. Yeah, Massive man. ship destroying sea monsters. Sea monsters. Looks like he's already been eaten. No. There's a cliff. <laughs> there's a cliff in the middle of the Atlantic and you'll just fall off the cliff. The funny thing is, Right there were hell. mathematicians uh, in the Middle East before the uh, Arab mathematician who figured out the size and circumference of the planet. This is back before like Islam made the acquiring of knowledge and science, you know, haram, and just started killing all those people. He figured it out. Christopher Columbus's navigation was wrong. He didn't. He thought the world was a lot smaller. He didn't think there was room for another continent. So he sailed there anyways. Found it. Basically, every bit of evidence kind of lead him toward this is not what Marco Polo was talking about. But it fits some of it, like they're not Irish, so it, it might be what Marco Polo was talking yeah. about. He just went with it. There was no point in his life when he said, maybe my calculations were wrong. This is the kind of guy who sails off the end of the planet. He was just like, yeah, yeah this must be it. So confirmation bias, is, <laughs> we all are, can be guilty of confirmation bias. And he arrived and he was like, welcome to the Indies. You are Indians, because I am in the Indies. And they were like, no, we're not. And he was like, nope, my calculations must be accurate. I mean, we can all be guilty of confirmation bias. Yeah. Um, and, and he was, but I think if you just got in that boat for three months and sailed around the world, uh, I'm not you know taking what? no for an answer. I'm not taking no for an answer. And I, they wouldn't have, the European monarchs wouldn't have funded his trip had he been going to an uninhabited land. Yeah. So he, uh, the pressure was on to find some gold. You making me a cocktail? Oh uh, yeah, I'm gonna make a cocktail. What are you making? So we're doing a very complicated drink here called Campari and soda. You do one and a half ounces of Campari. Spread it all over your counter. It gets really sticky. Leave it till morning. That makes it hard. Do you spread it on your notes as well? All over the notes. Okay, that's how you that's know good. that these are legit. These, that's these good. are legit. Yeah. And here's the trick. The special ingredient. Soda. <laughs> now, Italian construction workers buy this in little cans and drink it with their lunch. That's why they get almost nothing done in that entire country. What? You got so many mean Italian jokes. You guys peaked 500 years ago. Actually, probably a lot longer before that. <laughs> Enjoy your aqueduct. <laughs> Thank you. Salute. Salute. Now, what's the next step, Turner? We're mm. boiling water here. We're warming up the water. We got a lot of pasta. We got three pounds. We're doing fresh pasta, so it only takes literally about four minutes. Um, but we want to get the water going. The and you thing... salt the water. Oh, my gosh. L'acqua della pasta bisogna sare del mare. A little old Italian nun taught me that. Um, in, in Faenza, up in, again, Pia and, and Emilio Romagna. The, the water, the pasta water should taste like the sea. 
So when they salt their water, you see Italian American cooking shows and they have a thing of water and they'll put like a teaspoon of salt. Salt, like, like a hefty, for this I will probably use almost a quarter a cup of salt. L'acqua della pasta, the water of the pasta, bisogna sale del mare, should taste like the sea. Salt. I like it. You need salt water because it's the only way to give the pasta any flavor. Because as it cooks, it will absorb the salt and water. And it's one of those things where it's too much is too much, but too little is too little. Exactly. And I'm not going to give you a measurement. You yeah. have to search for it. The only other thing I was going to do while this is cooking through, and look how beautiful this is. So we have a beef neck in there. You know, when I put the meat in, I didn't go through the, what we had. We had a bunch of sausages. We had pork, and the pork is all broken up but the beef necks are going a little slower because beef is a little chewy. Ah, it's starting to break apart. So it still needs like another solid hour. Maybe our beloved editor here can do befores and afters to see how much the color has changed. The only thing I waited about three hours to do is that's a little too much. Um, I don't put the basil in the beginning because I wanted to keep some of its fresh flavor, so I wait a little while. And I will probably pull that out. I, I won't serve it with the, with the pasta. Um, but because you're not making a basil sauce, I'm not making, making a tomato sauce. I'm not making pesto, and I want to uh, now flavor the sauce. And so we got another hour to go, but it's looking beautiful. So I got some sausages, some big pork sausages, the pork itself. Look how much that's pulling. Oh my gosh, look at that! Isn't that beautiful? Everything you get. Just look at that. It's beautiful pulling a pork, and the the beef necks are a little tougher still. They got a, a ways to go. So the thing is, you don't need to buy the specific pork ribs or the specific beef next. What you need to buy is bone-in meat that's fat, <clears throat> that is fatty and bone. flavorful. Bone. That is it. You go there, you can empty your freezer. If you have a bone-in chicken breast and you've got a couple bone-in pork chops or leftover, this, you want, the bone adds a lot of the flavor. Fattiness, cheap. So go there. If, 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 if it's expensive to get this cut, then don't get it. Yeah. Get the cheap stuff. Don't because buy the, the good stuff. stuff. You're cooking it for hours. It braises off. It comes off. That's for, It's for flavor. It's for consistency. It's for substance. It's for uh, all of that. So don't blow the bank. Work with what you have. And try get a couple different meats in there. Don't be shy. The only thing I think that you really want to find, and it's easy, is an Italian sausage. Yeah. That's about it. And if you want, you want to make, you want to spend time, make some meatballs. But I, some people love them. I think it's a lot of work. I, I yeah, <laughs> it's meatballs a lot of spaghetti work. is very nice. It's very American, Italian American. It is not authentically Italian. Whatever. You guys didn't um, even have tomatoes. <laughs> Authentic yeah, Italian. You know, can we Chinese just, noodles just South cut, American I can, tomatoes. I can non posso più. I can't anymore. That's it. Done. Broccolini. You put that in, 375 until it's finished. It's fine. You don't have to remember that. Just Google it. I always forget. So how do you make garlic bread? This is, speaking of American. Yes. Garlic no, bread. No, garlic bread is thoroughly, thoroughly Italian. That's a joke. Garlic bread is probably as American, Italian-American as it gets. Um, they, they, you'll find like a, a, a focaccia that's got some garlic in it, but they don't do garlic bread like we do. So let's do a real Italian American garlic bread. And every time you thank a cop or a soldier for their service, don't forget to thank a waitress at the Olive Garden because unlimited breadsticks for bad customers <laughs> is hard work. Um, this is like this is like easy. I'm just literally taking soft butter, spreading it over bread, and. Um, and then I made a little bit of a garlic sauce in a pot, which is... That looks nice spreading like Wonder Bread. Exactly. Yeah. Boom. You want to give me that little pot with the garlic sauce in it? Yeah, so and what did you do here? I chopped up like eight cloves of garlic, a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of red pepper flake, and maybe about like a tablespoon of butter just because it kind of cools it at the end. The biggest thing about this, you don't want to burn garlic. Burnt garlic is bitter, and once it's burnt, you might as well throw it away. I make a great puttanesca sauce. Puttanesca is one of my one of my favorites. Now that's that's Neapolitan. Um, so I'm literally this just dumping some of this on, and we're gonna fold it together. You know what you could do? Just rip off some basil leaves and stick them on top. Whoa! Hey, sous chef, rip off some basil. <laughs> yeah, I said sous chef. <laughs> I'll, I'll beat him. Rip Where's off some basil spoon? leaves, put them on top. Where's and that wooden spoon? We'll do, we'll do two, two loaves. Two loaves of garlic bread? Oh my yeah. gosh, even I heard my accent there saying garlic bread. Oz a hard if you're from New York, so garlic bread. Um, and boom. We will fold that in half, wrap it in some tin foil, stick it in the oven, toast it up nice and crunchy, slice it up, makes everybody happy. You may not want to kiss anyone afterwards, but I don't think you were going to kiss me anyway tonight, were you? No, nope. not a kisser. Boom, tin foil. <clears throat> don't cuddle either. <laughs> 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 you 
You know why? It's gross. Because you're Irish, that's why. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm half Irish. Culturally and biologically and, programmed to socially distance. And come distanced. back to me in, in eight months <laughs> when we do the St. Patrick's Day special, and I will be thoroughly Irish as I am also Irish. But right now we're Italian. Affection is sin. On the counter behind you. Is this the Brunello? No, the Brunello. Oh, wonderful. So we're breaking our rules right here. Where's this gin from, James? From the Canary Islands. I will absolutely get time to eat. I still have to finish my Negroni. Oh, well then, oh. But there's one rule that you I'm, can't I'm okay, break. okay, thank you. And that is... I didn't know there were so many rules. I, I, I apologize. You can't get COVID through gin. Turner trusted me with doing the veal piccata. I'm not exactly sure why. I'm positive he's going to be overseeing me the entire time, like any good sous chef does. So we went out, we got some veal cutlets down at Eastern Market from the Glasgow and Sun. And there's three steps to this. Flour, which I mix with garlic powder, salt, pepper, and red pepper flakes. Beet eggs as the second step. And the third step is a mixture of plain breadcrumbs and panko, which gives it like a crispier, lighter kind of a flavor like you associate with seafood. If you're doing veal parmesan or something like that, you might add one third parmesan to that mix. This is messy. It's just gonna get messy. If you wanna be clean about it, if you have smaller, easier to handle pieces, then use only one hand because you want the other hand to turn on your sink to, to be able to wash things off. Same thing you're doing, if you're dipping anything for any kind of cooking, you just want to use one hand to keep one hand that's free. You can handle utensils, you can handle things without covering them in flour and everything else. And just, this is a messy recipe, especially with big cuts. It's just gonna happen. Just, just get over it. That's not my goddaughter, but she knows my goddaughter. The sisters. I'm gonna put the broccoli in the oven. What do you think, it's gonna take 20 minutes? 15. 15? Don't start it. No? Throw the bread in though. He always yells at me. He likes it. You know what? The baby crying makes it more Italian household because there's always a little bit of, uh, you know, Italians have lots of kids. And That's true. Yeah, so it just makes it more authentic. You know, <laughs> we, the only thing we're missing is like a nothing 90, wrong with We it. don't have a 90 year old. Like, we need an old lady who, you know, is, is either like crocheting something or yelling at everyone. You have the sensibilities of a 90 year old. Oh lady. my God. <laughs> We're going to do one of these with my mother, who you have not met, and she will play that role. She's not close to 90. She's, she's much younger, and she will play that role beautifully. The stories I know are, she's a legend. The woman is a legend. Takes no prisoners. <laughs> we have a mixture of butter and oil. Butter for the flavor, oil for the smoke too, point. Too, too early. Too, too early. Too early. All right, so Tuesday? here's how you tell. It's kind of hard to see, see with this camera, but if you add wood to the butter and the olive oil and it bubbles around the wood, that means that your oil is good. You want to be good. You want to mix butter and olive oil in this to get that flavor, but also raise the burning temperature because it's too easy to burn butter, honestly. You know what I've never made is carpaccio. I've always wanted to give it a shot. I think you just have to buy like a filet mignon and sear the sides and then chill it for a long, long time. Can we get the final product of that, Gray? Remember the before and after a couple hours ago? We were like, look at the before. And I like it all mixed up. I like it chunky. Like, look how dark it's gotten. Look how beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? And there's a couple bones here and there. Well, you know, if you get a bone, that's like that's like getting the little, the little king and the king cake in Spain. It's a, it's a, it's a treat. That is a French thing, isn't it? That's New Orleans. Oh, well, no, it's, uh, it's also a Spanish thing. Mediterranean Catholics have a lot of superstitions, you know what? unlike all, the Irish Catholics. All, all good no things. No superstitions. Eh, all Maybe good. a few fairies. All good things are Catholic <laughs> things. Okay, at this point, we've finished sauteing. Add some butter, add some olive oil, and this is where, you don't want to add too much. I probably added a little too much there. I can pour some off later because you're going to mix some wine in there. Exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. Add the shallots. Called being a sous chef. Add some garlic. Yeah, well, you're, you're a helpful one. I'm not very helpful. Add some garlic. As you can see, I do everything in moderation. Fruit of Kings. 
going to saute that for just a little bit, basically. Soften it up. And then you're going to add your stock. We are cooking for 14 people. So we're going to go with probably about half of the stock. And actually, if you can make your stock, do it. But if you can't, get the nice stuff. I mean, the cheap stuff. Get stock that's literally good enough to drink. Unable to open a jar. Tans are too buttery. Tans are a little greasy. Or are you just too weak? It's a combination of the two. Yeah. There you go. I, uh, you know, you just have to, you have to I go to mine. I can open my own jars. You have to go to mine and he'll you get it open. A towel. We got this fresh rigatoni at Canale in yeah. Eastern Market. We got a pasta guy. Three pounds of it. It's beautiful. He has wonderful pasta. He has really good stuff, uh, like um, tortellini and ravioli as well. And you don't need fresh pasta, but if you have a chance to get it, it's definitely nice. use it. It's wonderful. It makes a difference, but I most a lot of people don't have access to it. We do because we live in D.C. That comes with crime yeah. and fresh pasta. I'm sorry, I <laughs> or New York or Baltimore yeah, exactly. or. Yeah, a lot of places. I showed uh, off camera, sorry, I added a lot of salt because you want to salt your water really well. And as soon as I dump it in, I'm going to raise this as high as it goes because you want to bring it back to a boil as soon as possible. And this literally, if it's fresh pasta, two minutes, quite honestly. It's pretty easy. You want it out there. Not even. Now, Lid back over on. here at the pasta, over here at the sauce, I brought that chicken stock down to about half the size it was earlier, concentrated in it, and here's where you add the healthy part. That's the vegetable. What's Italian word for vegetable? Uh, uh, verdura or, yeah, it's or verdura. vegetal? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Always wash your hands when you're cooking because if you're actually cooking, you're using your hands. You just are. This is not fast food. This is real food. You need to wash your hands because you need to use them. Don't get grossed out. The funny thing is, is people don't think their chef is doing this in the restaurant. I got news to you. I spent, <laughs> I spent 10 years in, in food service. I'll, I'll throw it for you. Thanks. 10 years in food service. How do you think salads are made with rubber gloves and togs? <laughs> get real. <laughs> if I had capers, which I, I do. did strainer's ready to go. go. They would be going in right now. But we have a strange case of the missing capers here, so we're going to do a veal mayonnaise instead. We're just going to pretend that it was intentional. Everyone's going to play along, and it's fine. By the way, veal is such a delicate meat that or you really save don't them need the salt of the capers. Save them for soup. Save them for I like soup. It. There is the missing case of the capers. It's very bizarre. <laughs> what happened? We need to get the Hardy brothers on this. What happened? The Hardy to boys. The, the Hardy boys. What happened to the damn capers? We had a jar of capers. A half hour ago, and then everyone started drinking. I, 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 I pray to St. Anthony. Please, St. Anthony, look around. Something's lost and can't be found. He's never let me down. You know, if you ever go to the sanctuary of St. Anthony in Padua, you see all of the uh, uh, miracles that have been realized in his honor, and it's, it's pretty remarkable. It's... <laughs> Now, you may, know, you may be noticing that the veal's getting cold. It's fine. It's thin. I pour that sauce over it. It's going to be fine. And what do you think? Do you try to add some more lemon or just cook it down a little bit more? I think a little bit of wine could help. That's really good. A little more lemon or a little more butter? No, I think it needs to reduce a little bit. That's it? All right. Cool. That's really good. You don't need to reheat. If you're doing this with chicken, which is going to generally be thicker, then you are absolutely fine, especially if you're cooking for less than 14 people. Take those cutlets and just toss them back in the sauce just to warm them up at the very end. If I was cooking for less than 14, I'd do that. But honestly, it's fine. Let's make the salad. Fresh mozzarella, off also from Canales. There's two brothers who own the places down there. They're from the famous buffalo of, of, of uh, um, Southwest DC. Yeah. Down by the baseball stadium, they're a huge buffalo. I got news to you. They make <laughs> fr fresh mozzarella. That ain't, that ain't, ain't, ain't it's, not a, it's not witchcraft to make it. It's just time, dedication, and just making it fresh. I mean, if you don't want fresh Parmesan, you do want fresh mozzarella. If you can pull it apart like string cheese, then that's fine. Do that in chicken parm. But if you want it fresh, that won't cut it. I like my pasta al dente, as they say, which is with a little bit of chew. 
And um, is that what that al dente means? Al Chew? dente, literally to the tooth. But um, but the yeah. Italian language sounds so fancy. To the it's so not to the tooth. <laughs> but you can also just say with some bite. In the English, the best English is with a little bit of bite. I'm gonna save a uh, little bit of pasta water in case we need it. I in always case. forget to do that. I always forget to That's do that. That's because you're not Italian. That's all right. Now, these not... ugly bastards are basically the only tomatoes that I was able to grow in my garden all year because I had a busted down truck out back because I'm very classy. And it blocks the sun. Also, I'm, growing, I'm trying to grow tomatoes in a flower bed. But those are good tomatoes. The profumo. I lost one, but that's okay. Did you? Oh. This makes everybody happy. <laughs> I'm happy. Oh, I really am. Like, it's just, you know, it's been, what time did we start this? Five a, hours a ago? A hush falls over the drunken crowd. I know. It, like, everyone got quiet as they got to this stage. It's just like when Casey came it's, to the bat. Oh, it's just, you know, it makes life worth living. There will be joy in Mudville. I used to always serve them as an appetizer with the other cheeses. You know, you can't really do it because people need a plate. And unless they're walking around with cocktail plates, making a mess, which they won't be, they're never going to touch it. You end up eating it. By the way, it's fine the next day. You wake up, you stumble down the stairs, kids are yelling, dogs are barking. <laughs> Eat some soggy caprese. It's a fine morning. But chop it up. Mix it with some basil. Throw in some good salt, Maidan salt, which is what I prefer. There's one platter of, of that's just Italian American in a nutshell. It may not be Italian, but it's definitely Italian American. You see that the Maidan salt is good, good and flaky, I would very love light. Some. Yes, thank you. You can totally eat that like a Kit Kat. Bar. Thank you. Sure. It's a good opportunity right now, Caprese, to use a good olive oil. I really like the Lodomio. I don't know how to say it exactly. Bought it while drunk. Um, don't I regret it at all. With him. I'll tell you what. I make fun of the Italians, but they really know what they're doing. Discovering America and teaching us how to eat. The only way to know when your sauce is finished is to taste the sauce and then ask your buddy. It's just the same thing as grilling. There's one person to grill and one person to tell him what he's doing wrong or right. That's really good. You can only get that flavor when you just reduce it. It's a scoffier. In the name of the Father, the Filho, the Spirit of the Santo, Amen. Benedici, Signore, noi, il cibo che stiamo per prendere, per Cristo, nostro Signore, Amen. And in English translation, bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts which you're about to receive, for Christ our Lord, Amen. 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 <laughs> all in all, I'd say that Columbus Day is a little more tasty than Thanksgiving. No offense to Thanksgiving, but the Italians make better food than the Indians. Yeah. It's just, it's just the truth. So here's to the, here's to the Italians. Here's to Christopher Columbus. Here's, here's to you. Here's to our guests, the our people guests. who actually enjoy Thank the you. food. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for dinner. I want some closing remarks. I'm Chris Bedford at the Federals. Daniel, Daniel Turner, Turner, why don't you sign off for something deep? Daniel Turner, Power of the Future, Buona Festa, Grazia, Cristoforo Colombo. Thanks to Christopher Columbus and to exploration and to courage and to Western culture. Cheers. Cheers. You gotta think of Nancy Pelosi's father. Let me say it properly. Nancy Pelosi's father, who was the who was the mayor of Baltimore, <laughs> who had a statue of Columbus erected to honor the Italian Americans. What a guy! And 60, 70, however many years later, as Speaker of the House, she let that statue be torn down and dragged through the streets and thrown in the friggin' Potomac. And she stood there silent. What a dishonor 
to the Italian American people. You mess with my dad's wall when you're growing up. A dishonor, it like traps for you. A dishonor to Italian Americans, a dishonor to Columbus, a dishonor to her heritage. But she's an dishonorable person, so I'm not surprised. Vergognosa. Vergognosa. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not Italian, but I can understand what that means. Mm -hmm.